Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have been going for, through the last uh, few weeks, uh, last eight weeks as we've said, uh, the attributes of God, just different characteristics about him, with the intention and hope and desire to know him better and to be able to trust in his word and to trust in his purpose and plan for our life. And I, and I hope that as we've gone through this last eight weeks, that it hasn't been just a bunch of head knowledge, but that the characteristics and attributes of God that he describes uh, of himself in the scriptures have led you into a deeper understanding and dependence upon him. And today we're going to talk about the last of the attributes that I, you could talk endlessly about the attributes of God, really. I mean, there are zillions of them. But I, uh, I want to talk about this last one because I think it is the most important. Um, the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the Colossians, tells them, gives them this series of commands, and then tells them, uh, finally, that as, as you like do all these things, finally put on love which binds everything together. And when we talk about the attributes of God, I really think that love is the characteristic of God that uh, binds all of the other ones together, kind of gives all of the other ones their power and meaning and strength and depth. So we've talked about God's power in his omnipotence, uh, but we all know that power without love is a pretty t terrible, terrible and terrifying thing. Uh, to be all-knowing without being loving is uh, a very scary and insecure thing. To be uh, present at all times and in all places, yet to not be loving. Imagine that the deep insecurity that you would feel if somebody was constantly watching you with a malicious heart. Or unchanging. Imagine a person who wasn't loving and would never change. <laughs> that would be a pretty lousy thing. Incomprehensible. That you never knew what they were going to do, but, it, but they weren't loving, right? You could never be quite certain about them, but you knew that they weren't loving, right? Or that they were the sovereign ruler and dictator, king of the world, but they weren't loving. History is replete with those kinds of people, people who are uh, tyrannical rulers who have been given far too much power and authority and who uh, do not love the people in whom they're trusted to. Um, so love is actually the characteristic that is most important when it comes to the attributes of God because it binds all of the other ones together in a way that is so so important for us as believers and shapes and colors each of these attributes in a way that is favorable to our own disposal in life, okay? Um, so it's what I want to focus on today. 1 John 4, uh, verse 17, or verse 7 says very specifically, and it's one of the, the places where you, you don't get this with the other attributes. It never says like, God is power, okay? Okay. Uh, or God is wisdom. But instead, you know, in, in John chapter 4, it gives us this word where it says, God is love. That blankly, that, 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 that clearly, that specifically. If you want to know what God is like, the place where you should start and the place where you should end is with his love which he has shown to, to creation. So let's, let's just focus on that a little bit. There's a, uh, there's a passage that I want to start by thinking about God's love, and I'll just kind of use it as the framework for the beginning of our sermon. Okay, uh, so Paul in the book of Ephesians has this great prayer, potentially one of Paul's best prayers. He, Paul prays all the time. There was once I handed out a big list of all of Paul's prayers. It's like seven pages long of Paul's prayers that he just says for people. Okay, but the one in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, uh, is, is among his most most powerful. Uh, he says this to the Ephesians. He says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, okay, that, that like because your roots and your foundation in life is the love of Christ, okay, because of that, that you may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp what? How wide 
and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all of the fullness of God. That's a great prayer, folks. If you want a prayer to pray like with your family or to write on your mirror or to keep on your dashboard or whatever, you can pray that for your entire life and not exhaust the possibilities of the depths of God's love that he has for you. Okay? It is a wonderful, wonderful prayer. Let's just think about it, though, for a second, because it's, it's kind of a good, a good verse to meditate on. Okay, so it, Paul says that God's love is wide. Okay? God's love is wide, like it's sort of all-encompassing. That's the idea. It's, it's, it's wide. It's like arms spread out wide. Um, that's, that's the idea of, of God's love being a, a width. And that's, that refrain is kind of said throughout Scripture, okay? And you guys know some kind of key passages, like this one from Psalm 145, 17, that says, The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and loving toward all that he has made. That is a really profound statement, but it's particularly when we think about God as the maker of all things. That when he thinks about the stars in the heavens, his disposition toward them is love. That when he thinks about the ants in the ground, his disposition towards them is love. And when he thinks about you, whom he has made, his disposition towards you is love. Right? He's righteous in all of his ways and loving toward all that he has made. Uh, John 3.16, we're going to kind of truncate the verse here. Uh, you all know it very well, but just to focus on one part specifically, uh, it says that God so loved not just a few people individually, not just his church, not just the people who were good, uh, not just the nice and beautiful things, but the entire world. And then he loved it so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for it. Pretty powerful to think about. And when I think about the width of God's love, I often think about the narrowness of mine. Okay? And I don't know, like, it's, it, this is kind of a good way to just uh, contrast these verses to think, well, God's love is wide. How am I doing? Like, how wide are my arms spread? How sort of like, how, how, uh, how what's the width of the pale of love that I cast to the world? Is it, um, is it wide or is it narrow? Do I have a short list of people that I love or a pretty long list? When I look at my neighbor, particularly the ones that like, I'm not really uh, too favorably disposed towards, is, am I pressed to love them? Or am I content with a, a narrow uh, love? I, that can be kind of convicting to me. Actually, one of, the, one of the most convicting verses in Scripture to me is uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, and it has to do with love being narrow. Um, and it's, uh, it's from, well, it's, it's from Matthew and from Luke. It's repeated twice because it's that important. <laughs> but Jesus says this to his disciples when he's teaching them in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Uh, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to them and lend them without expecting back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind and to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's a striking passage to me that just like kind of highlights my own narrowness. Those first words when, it just asks, when Jesus asked that question, do you just love those people who love you? I, my my kind of knee-jerk reaction is like, yeah, kind of. And, and, and Jesus says, that's easy. That is easy to do. Everybody does that. It is not hard to love people who love you. But the harder thing is, is to love the person who is kind of unlovable, to love the person who is kind of cantankerous, to love the person who just gets under your skin. Because when we do that, then we begin to look a lot more like the love that God has 
for us and the love that he has shown us who are the unlovable, cantankerous, get under your skin sort of people. And God's love is wide. It's wide in our lives. God's love is long. And here's the idea, because uh, long and wide are sort of like similar terms. Long, when, it's, when it uses the word long, it means like long-suffering. Like you've got, like when, it, when, when you are, um, you're, that your love can last and stand the test of time, right? That's the kind of description of God's love that it has. So Jeremiah 3, or Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 3 says this. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. You know what I like about this, this passage is uh, a lot of times when the Bible speaks and uses the word you, we don't have like a really good way to translate uh, when it's in the plural. So we'll, it's like you all or um, y'all if you're from another part of town. Um, uh, but that's actually not the you that they're talking about here. This is a you singular. So when you read Jeremiah 31.3, you could just put your name in there. Okay? I have loved Kyle with an everlasting love. And Kyle, I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. Because God's love is long, it just doesn't grow weary. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't get worn out. That's the description of God's love for us. And if we're going to do the kind of comparison thing again, um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a good one. That our love can often be short, kind of short-lived, short-fused. You, you, have you, you ever done this? You just like sort of geared yourself up to love somebody. Maybe you've gone to like a family reunion or something. Or maybe it's the holidays coming up, and you say, okay, we've got three days with the relatives. I'm just going to gear myself up to love them as best as I can um, by speaking as little as possible and by being around as little as possible. Okay? And after a bit, you, you've, you've heard the political rants and you've, you've heard the, uh, the thoughts and the things that bother you and the stories of the last year that get under your skin. And finally, after 15 minutes, you just burst. And the love runs short. And you strike out and say something that's mean. And then you, you, you try to patch it up and, and, uh, and let it go until next Thanksgiving when you've got to eat another turkey together. Right? Our love can be short sometimes. It can be short, but God's love is not. God's love is long. So when you think that God is sort of fed up or done with you, when you think he probably won't forgive me again, how could God love me for this or love me for that thing again? How could he possibly endure this thing that I have done or said or thought? Read Jeremiah 31.3 that his love is long Suffering, long suffering for us. This is the one I, I this is the one I wanted to leave out because I don't really understand it. That God's love is high. What does it mean that God's love is high? I just kind of found some scripture passages that reiterated this um, idea. So Romans eight. Uh, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, uh, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just reiterating this idea that God's love is high. Now maybe he's, it's talking like in a philosophical sort of sense, uh, like in Isaiah where it says that his ways are beyond our ways and, and his understanding is beyond our understanding, that also his love is sort of higher than we can understand and goes beyond our own sort of depths of, of, uh, and definitions of what love really is. Or maybe it's like a political thing or it's like a kind of stature societally that, you know, you can... Um, we can have a disdain towards those people who are kind of higher up, maybe. But God, uh, in his wisdom, calls us to pray for both the high and the low in life. Um, and that God, not only did he, did he uh, as, is, as is well taught, that he was 
spend his time around tax collectors and sinners, but he also spent his time and loved the high and mighty in society too, because his love is, is, is high. I don't know. You, you can think about this. You can think about this and then preach to me on maybe the height of God, God's love, because I don't, I don't always get that one. But I have some ideas, and regardless, if you're in a position, maybe it's when you're in a plane. I don't know. And you're scared that it's going to go down, that God's love is high. Or when you're on a ladder <laughs> and fearful that you're going to fall, that God's love is high. Um, but nonetheless, God's love is wide and long and high and deep. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. It's sort of a vague verse, actually, especially the second half when it says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath what, exactly? Right? What's the idea? Underneath what? And I think this gets at the depth of God's love. It's underneath anything. Like, you could be as low as possible in life, whether it's like low with depression, or low in money, or low economically, or low emotionally. Like, well, however do you want to define low, the promise of God is that underneath that, even below that, are the everlasting arms of God. Like you just can't get deep enough. You go down to the Mariana Trench at the bottom of the sea, and the scriptures would say God's love, his arms, are there in that situation. So God's love is deep. And Again, this is sort of convicting to me when I think about my own shallowness of love. And even societally, have you ever thought about how shallow our word for love is? That I can say in the same breath, I love my grandma and I love pizza rolls, right? Sort of strange, right? It kind of gets at, or if you just even listen to the way that we use love, right? I love this car. Really? Come on. You know, I love, uh, uh, I love this food, or I love this house, or the amount of inanimate objects that we ascribe love to is kind of a strange thing. And can describe oftentimes our own shallowness, especially when we put our love for those things above our love for the animate objects that he puts right in front of us. Right? When we love money more than people. When we love uh, our job more than our family when we love our phone more than the person who's sitting across the table from us. It's a shallow sort of love that we can display sometimes. But not God's love. God's love is deep. And underneath every situation are his everlasting arms of love. The scriptures, and I, don't, I was really glad for, uh, for the version of the translation that John read from, from John 14 today, because it has a very profound verse in it, okay, that I want to think about kind of in our closing section of this sermon. When we think about God's love, if you want to begin to understand the depths of it, go to John 14, um, no, John 13, excuse me. Uh, John 13, uh, verse 1, uh, when it says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were with him, or who were in the world, he now showed the full extent of his love. That's like the greatest introduction to the events that are about to happen in the scriptures than you could ever get. You want to know the full extent of God's love. It doesn't say this anywhere else in the, in the Bible, guys. Uh, it, it says it right here. If you want to know the fullest extent of God's love, dot, 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 Pay attention. Listen up. Here it comes. He's now going to show it to you. And if you don't know what comes after John 13, it is a fascinating thing to think about. What is the fullest extent of God's love? Here's the first part. The master, all-powerful, all-knowing, takes off his robe, leans down with his disciples, and does the humble job of the lowliest sermon, servant to wipe the dirt and nastiness off of the feet of his disciples. Right? 
And he doesn't just do it for those who love him. Okay, do you remember who's there? It says it in like verse 4. It says that Judas Iscariot is there. The one who will betray him. The one who will, the one who will leave him and cast him off. Okay? That Jesus leans down, washes his feet as well as he goes around to the disciples. What's the fullest extent of God's love? It's that God became a servant in Christ Jesus and knelt down to see and wash the lowliest, nastiest parts of our life. The story carries on in the full extent of God's love. That um, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane interceding for his people and for the world moments before he would die. Moments before he would be betrayed. That God knelt down. You notice that he's alone. Why is that? Well, because his disciples' love is like a little bit shallow. And they could pray with him for a little bit, but then they fell asleep. But he endured because his love is long-suffering as he kneels in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? He stands with the high and mighty uh, of, of his age in the palaces uh, and porticos of, uh, of Pilate, the political figures, and is cast off, uh, sent to be flogged uh, to show the full extent of his love for his people, okay? He carries across to the streets of Jerusalem uh, in mockery as people uh, hurl insults at him as he carries his cross that he did not deserve, uh, that was ours to bear, to show the full extent of his love, how wide and how high and how deep and how long is the love of God. He was hung on a cross to show the full extent of his love for his people. And he did not cast down or hurl insults as they were cast up to him, but said, Father, forgive them. He said things like, Today you will be with me in paradise, because he was showing the fullest extent of his love. Right? And then he rose from the grave and brought us out of our graves to show the fullest extent of his love. This is what John is getting at in John, 1 John chapter 4, when he said that, says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If you desire um, to know the depths of the love of God, this is the place to look. Look to his cross, look to his passion, look to his empty tomb to see the fullest extent of the love that God has for you specifically. And I pray that that love, as you meditate and live in that love, will transform yours and my love to know and display the width and the length and the height and the depth of God's love that he has and that we have for him and for our neighbors around us. Would you join me in a, uh, a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, how wide and long and high and deep is the love that you have shown us in your Son, Christ Jesus. As he has loved us, may we love one another with a long-suffering, wide and high and deep love. In your name that we pray. Amen.